episode number 107, my interview with New York Times bestselling author Kevin Cruz. Welcome to the Web Marketing That Works podcast. Come behind the scenes of real life marketing experiments and listen in as amazing guests confess the truth about what really works. Now, here are your hosts, Adam Franklin and Toby Jenkins. Hello there. My name is Toby Jenkins and this is the Web Marketing at Works podcast. Thank you very much for joining me today. This is the show for people who love marketing on the web. So we take you behind the scenes of real life marketing experiments. We share the good, the bad and the ugly. And in this show today, I'm speaking with Kevin Cruz. Now, Kevin is an Inc. 500 serial entrepreneur. He's built several multi-million dollar companies that have won awards for both fast growth as well as employee engagement over the last 20 years. He's also a New York Times bestselling author and has been named one of the top 100 business thought leaders by Trust Across America. Kevin, to give you a bit more insight, has worked with Fortune 500 CEOs, startup founders, the US Marine Corps officers and non-profit leaders as well in his work, particularly around employee engagement. And now in today's episode, we talk about how he's used books to help market his business and some of the successes and failures around that. Particularly, one great story that I enjoyed was why a book that took him three days to write has massively outperformed one that took him a year. We also dive into his latest project, which is Time Management and Extreme Productivity Hacks, where he interviewed billionaires, entrepreneurs, Olympic athletes, and straight A students. And full disclosure, there is a small quote from me in the book, but it's a fascinating conversation. Conversation with Kevin, I really love talking about this stuff. And I was really interested to learn much more from what he'd learned from his research. So in here, we talk about how the prospect of death can be used to drive productivity, why to-do lists are ineffective and what the actual alternative is and what we all need to do to counteract that. And also, we talk about some counterintuitive advice from Intel's founding CEO, Andy Groves, and much, much more, to be quite frank. So this show, as always, is brought to you by our book, web marketing that works and specifically the bonus 33 free templates that go with it. You can download them from bluewiremedia.com.au slash book. Hope you enjoy the show. Okay, so Kevin, thank you so much for joining me on the show. It's so great to have you here today. I'm excited to be here, Toby. Thanks. Yeah, it's awesome. Look, I wanted to, uh, where are you talking from at the moment? I am uh, from just outside of Philadelphia on the east coast of the United States. Fantastic. And I'm on the Gold Coast. So uh, that puts us in two very different time zones, (laughs) (laughs) very different parts of the world. Kevin, before we get started, I'm always interested to know of our guests, what fires you up each morning? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, the first thing that fires me up is uh, I'm a single dad with three kids, including two teenage girls. So um, wow. I'm a bright. <laughs> yeah, I know people people are uh, sympathizing with me all over the world, Toby. That's so that's one thing that's an instant uh, connection with others who, uh, who who have teenage daughters or are fearing that their their daughters are going to become teens. But uh, now they're they're good kids. And um, I get up bright and early to make sure I see them off to school every day. But you know what? What I'm fired up about is I always, you know, the little saying I have is that life is about making an impact, not an income. And, you know, if you do it right, the income will come anyway. That's the irony. But I'm just looking to serve others. And, you know, as you know, the latest project is, you know, I'm fascinated on, you know, how to help entrepreneurs and others with getting more done with achieving extreme productivity. But deeper than that, I mean, my whole last 30 years, it's just been about trying to fulfill my own potential and help others to fulfill theirs. Yeah, interesting, because that was going to be my next question, which was what do you feel, I mean, across your books and across your entrepreneurial projects as well, you know, has that, what has been the piece that's tied all, you know, your body of work, I guess, for want of a better term? What's been the piece that's tied it all together, do you think? Yeah, and and it probably, I mean, it's a broad topic, but when I I really do ask myself that question and I struggle with it uh, because, you know, probably what I'm most known for is, you know, I've written several books on leadership and employee engagement, and and I'm very passionate about the fact that, you know, leadership is not a choice. You know, leadership is influence, and we influence people around us, you know, whether we want to or not. That's one topic I've spent a lot of time on. You know, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've had some you know, some modest success with my businesses and probably the questions I answer more than any other is from people who 
you know, want to start a new business or they want to grow the business they have. So I've got that entrepreneurial piece. And then, you know, the latest project has been all about time and productivity. And that, Toby, came because, I mean, when I was young and dumb, a young and dumb entrepreneur, I mean, I was trying to win through hustle. You know, there was always more on the to-do list. So I would sleep less, eat less, take care of myself less. And it didn't work. And I always knew, and eventually I learned, you know, I went from working over 100 hours a week with failed companies and eventually a million dollar year company to 10 years later having a, a $12 million year company, but I was working less than 40 hours a week. So, you know, I'm passionate about teaching others a new way to, to look at, at productivity. But so you got leadership, you got, you know, productivity, you got entrepreneurship, but all of it is just about achieving your potential and whether that's, you know, to launch your own business, whether it's to be more effective in the organization that you work for, whatever it might be, you know, I think that's the common thread is just about maximizing potential. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, that's certainly something that I feel passionately about as well. And I guess it's one thing to do it for yourself, but then it's another to teach it. And that seems to be, I mean, you've written not only one book, but you've now written four. So I'm sort of interested in terms of how was that process? Why did you you know, what's kept you coming back? Because I know how tough it can be to write one book and this latest book, The 15 Secrets of Time Management. So why specifically have you chosen to write a book in four times? <laughs> yeah, I guess I, I wanted to be a writer ever since I was a little kid. And I think primarily of fiction and I've written uh, a, a couple of, uh, you know, I've got a drawer full of half written novels that I'm sure someday I'll, I'll finish up. Have but you? I've, I've, what, oh, yeah. What's the genre there? Well, it's mixed. There's some there's some uh, y- young adult uh, fiction, and then also some thriller type fiction. So nothing too uh, serious. More about you know fun, but trying to to uh, uh, write you know in a way write the kind of books that I like to read, as they as they say. Yeah. Um, and so that writing passion, I mean, I always had it inside me. And I did a book a long time ago. You know, I procrastinated on it. Finally, I wrote it. It was a very painful process. And I took 10 years off. And then when I sold my last business, I teamed up with uh, one of my old business partners. And we said, hey, let's really write, you know, this book on leadership that we, we've we been talking about. I had some extra time in my hands, having gotten out of one business. And um, even that book, though, you know, Toby, it was a traditionally published book with Wiley. Took me almost a year to write it, to revise it, to get it ready for them. Even though they paid in advance, it wasn't anywhere near what I could have made if I had, you know, worked in a, in a regular company or with a regular job. And that book, most people think did great because it hit the New York Times bestseller, which is a yeah, nice congratulations. badge. Yeah, well, that's a great badge. You never but, have to let that one go. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I'm, you know, I, I use it when I, when, I, when I think it'll help me. But the reality is it, it doesn't matter. Like that, that New York Times bestseller, it didn't lead to any inbound calls for speaking engagements. It didn't automatically, you know, land on the top shelf in bookstores. Like it really didn't, didn't do that much. And I, I kind of licked my wounds for a year and then I found like this underground group of writers, these indie authors, independent authors who are saying like, oh, you know, that's that traditional book publishing model's dead. Here's a new way to do it. I studied it and um, I wrote, so the, the book, the, the New York Times bestseller was called We, W-E, it's about employee engagement. Then I wrote a book in three days and, I, and I'm I, wow. I, I hesitate to share that, Toby, because I don't want people to think this is easy. But I wrote a book called Employee Engagement 2.0. It's, I don't know, less than 100 pages. I wrote it in three days. And that book, if you search employee engagement on Amazon, that book comes up as number one. And it has for years now. The book that was the New York Times bestseller through the traditional publisher, that's like number 25 when you search on employee engagement. So I make all the royalties is from that little three-day book, nothing from the New York Times bestseller. I get one inbound call a week asking me to do a keynote speech from people who read that three-day book that I did myself. I never get a call from anybody that's read the New York Times bestseller. And so that was encouraging. And I did it again. And I, and I did it with uh, 15 secret successful people know about time management. Now, that 15 secrets, that took me most of a year because I interviewed, as you know, you're, you're in the book, you know, I, I, I interviewed over yeah, 200. Thanks, thanks for that. Oh, you yeah. know, it was great. You gave great advice. I mean, 
I reached out to Olympians. I reached out to entrepreneurs. I reached, I talked to seven billionaires, including Mark Cuban. And I just wanted to pick their brain about time and productivity. So I purposely took my time doing the research on this book. But once again, I knew, you know, there's two ways, the slow, low paid way, which is go to a traditional publisher or launch it myself. And it's done great. It's been out there for a month. It's the most successful book I've had thus far. You search on time management, it's number one in all the categories. And so, I mean, this is a long way to answer your question, Toby, but like yeah, nice I had question. I had that that kernel of wanting to be a writer and I did it the traditional way and it hurt. I mean, it was painful and really didn't give me a lot of results back. It certainly didn't reach enough people, didn't make the impact I wanted. And then I just discovered wow, you know, maybe there's a time to do it traditionally, but if you just want to get your word out, if you want to make some money along the way, if you want the phone to ring with opportunities, there's a way to indie publish it and get a platform that you never get from the traditional publishers. And, and that's been exciting to me. And I plan to do, you know, more than one book a year now that I understand the right way to do it. Again, it's, it's the back to that time and productivity. You could take a year to write one book that, almost nobody reads, makes almost no impact, or you could spend, I mean, you know, I did the first one in three days, but call it a month, call it two months, whatever it is. You could spend a fraction of that time, launch it yourself and make 10 times the impact. You know, it's just one example of, of you know, productivity mindset shifts and hacks that have just massive results. That's a classic hack, isn't it? I mean, and, and I'm interested in the sort of indie writers that you sort of identified as people that you wanted to learn from to do it as an independent project. Who were they and how did you then sort of go through the, that learning process with them? Yeah, well, the I mean, I think the absolute god of indie publishing is a guy named Steve Scott or sometimes he goes by S.J. Scott. He has written uh, and he has an internet marketing background and then he sort of <laughs> discovered this uh, independent publishing. And I don't, I mean, I don't know how many, but he cranks out a book, I mean, every couple of months. And he right now, if you were to go onto Amazon for the business category, there's rankings of who the top business authors are. Now there's 23 million books on Amazon and there's hundreds of giant authors that most people would know their names, business names. Steve Scott is number one. He's outselling everybody in the business category wow. um, because he's got so many of these books out there. So, I mean, he's the best and he's got a website. He's got a, uh, a couple of podcasts out there. Uh, everybody can, can study his stuff. On the author stuff, you know, I got a blog called author journey to 100k $100,000 that I've chronicled everything I do from picking a title to launching the book to the promotional campaigns I chronicle it sometimes I'm posting twice a day so people can just do what I do you know so that's a website author journey to 100k.com and then um, on Facebook there's a group called Pat's first Kindle book. It has to do with, uh, that's run by Pat Flynn. Yep. And there's a whole bunch of, you know, really cool ninja authors in that group that are just killing it online as well. Yeah. Oh, fantastic, man. I mean, I'm always interested to know how, how people go about their journey and thanks for sharing that. And I mean, a marketing, a, a book, sorry, is just a classic marketing tool of its own right. But equally, as you've clearly demonstrated, having the book on its own isn't enough, you know, particularly now in a world with 23 million books accessible to everyone, sort of marketing that content is so important as well. Yeah, and Toby, you know, I talked to you about like, the question I get more than any other is from entrepreneurs or wannabe entrepreneurs. And I say, okay, how do I start? What's the first thing I can do? And, and they're not expecting me to say it, but usually my advice is go write a book. Because as you said, I mean, at the very least, a book is going to be the best business card you ever have. And almost everybody, you know, wants to write a book or has a book in them. And even if it's not, you know, a 400 page, you know, heavy volume, writing uh, even a modest sized book, I mean, that's a step most people will never take. You know, you're pitching, uh, you're pitching business at a company and there's three people pitching that business and you walk in for your meeting and slap your book down as you slide it across the table. That's your business card. And if no one else has done that, I mean, there's a reason why, you know, the, the word authority, 
The first part of that word is author, right? <laughs> authority yeah. is author. And what I found is not only is it a great business card, great authority builder, but it's a great lead generator. So, you know, whether you give your book away for free online, and that's something, you know, that I'm experimenting with now, whether you uh, give it as a gift or whether you just rank highly in Amazon.com. So people who are searching on, you know, digital marketing all of a sudden find your book and then discover you. I mean, these are all great ways that a book is going to advance your career and, and advance your company. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Well, let's jump into this latest project then, Kevin, the 15 Secrets of Successful People of Time Management. I'm sorry, I kind of butchered that, but I know it's actually no, quite, it's, a, <laughs> quite a long title. It um, is. It's fine. That's fine. You got so it. So do you want to give us the full title? <laughs> yeah, it, I think I probably thought I was going to get paid by the word in the title. So <laughs> yeah, the, the title's 15 Secrets Successful People Know About Time Management, and the subtitle is the productivity habits of seven billionaires, 13 Olympic athletes, 29 straight-A students, and 239 entrepreneurs. <laughs> yeah, wow. That's, that's such a great title. And I mean, it, I guess you've provided quite a, it's quite a diverse group that you've, you've chosen then to pull your um, advice from. So I was really interested in that aspect. Why did you decide to go seeking sort of different areas of advice? Yeah, it's funny. I, you know, a book that made an impact on me, and I'm, and I'm not trying to compare myself to him, but, you know, my father, when I was probably 13 years old, you know, gave me a copy of Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich, and, you know, a classic in uh, self-development and in uh, entrepreneurship. And what, you know, Napoleon Hill did is he didn't just say, well, you know, I'm a smart guy, so I'm going to write down all the things, all my advice for how, how to get rich. He went out and interviewed, you know, over 100 millionaires back in the day and then, you know, looked at what they said and boiled it down. And that was kind of my inspiration. I mean, I, I certainly had my experience as I went from young and dumb to, to being a little bit wiser with, with my time and productivity. But I wanted to know, like, what did other people have to say? And I knew that uh, I wanted to help entrepreneurs. That was my background. And I think, to, you know, it's a, it's a myth that you can just win through hustle and we need to brag about the all-nighters we've pulled and how rarely we take vacations and all that. But, you know, I always want to learn from other groups. I mean, that's how, you know, you and I originally connected is I thought, okay, you know, who else is going to be, who else is going to have big goals, you know, so there's a lot at stake and really is going to be have to really maximize their time and Olympic athletes and, and, you know, athletes who are training for Rio right now, for example, I mean, you know, I knew that you just have to have a different mindset and you probably had different habits and rituals than average performers, which you do. I same similar thought. I thought about, you know, self-made millionaires and even billionaires. I mean, do they think differently? Do they do different things than, than average people? And the final group, as I was just kind of thinking about kind of extreme productivity, extreme performance, were straight A students. I mean, you know, I interviewed straight A students from the the uh, American, you know, Ivy League schools from Harvard and MIT. And it can't be easy to be a straight A student at those places. So absolutely you know, to, not. It's like, how yeah. do they deal with it? And I was looking, you know, I was looking to see what was the same. What are the people all doing the same in the different groups? How are they different? And I had other groups I wanted to get to, but it just was taking so long. Like I started getting feedback from from astronauts. I was I was oh, reaching wow. out to astronauts thinking, wow, they got to be really disciplined <laughs> too, right? Oh, and then yeah. I'm like, you know, this could go on forever. I don't want this to be a 10 year long project. So I just cut it off. I, I There were other billionaires that were I was going to talk to. I'm like, you know what? That could be a second volume someday. <laughs> enough, enough is enough. That can be the 30 tips. <laughs> right, right. Because 15 isn't enough. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic, Kevin. That's awesome. And in terms of that, like, let's dig into some of the habits then. You know, what were the unique habits and productivity tips from these people? Yeah, I, you know, I think, like I said, there's, there's a lot, but like, here's a couple of big ones that jump out. So, the first thing isn't actually a habit, it's a mindset. And, and people will always groan because it's like, just tell me what to do or not, do, right? <laughs> But behaviors do result from a mindset. You know, if I believe smoking cigarettes is going to make me look cool and keep me skinny, I'm more likely to smoke. If I think smoking cigarettes smells nasty and is disgusting, is going to kill me from cancer, I'm not going to smoke. You know, mindset drives behaviors. And the one thing that just came out from every interview I did was that ultra productive people, high achievers, 
they know in their bones that time is our most valuable asset. I mean, we can lose money and make it back again. We can lose our health, we can get sick, but then get healthy again. And this sounds really harsh, but I mean, we can break up with our spouse and remarry the love of our life a year from now, right? It happens all the time. But time, you know, we have 1,440 minutes in a day. When they're gone, we never, ever, ever get them back. I say that's the number that can change your life. You know, I'm looking at a little 1440 sign that I have taped to the bottom of my monitor right now. You know, <laughs> you might have to put one on mine. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's just once you truly feel that time is so precious, then the habits, the to do's and the don't do's become fairly easy because, you know, it's, it's, People say they know time's their most important asset, but then they let everybody steal their time with got a minute meetings and, hey, I'm a stranger, but let me hop on the phone for 15 minutes and pick your brain or whatever. You know, all of a sudden, you, you really realize the value of every minute and ultra productive people are thinking about minutes. They're not thinking about hours or days. It's really down to the minute. All the rest of the stuff really falls into place. So, you know, I guess, I don't know. What do you think about that, Toby? It starts with mindset. Yeah, look, I couldn't agree more, Kevin. I actually... um had a really interesting interview that Tim Ferriss did with the guy's name is escaping me now, which is frustrating. But um, he's the founder of Wired Magazine, Kevin Kelly. Actually, he's another Kevin. Oh yeah, there. yeah, yeah, Kevin Kelly. Um, right. And he sort of spoke a little while about an, an experiment, a six month till you die experiment that he did. And that really, what would I do if these were the last six months and I knew the date on which I was going to die and and one thing he did that I've subsequently done as well was that he went into the actuarial tables and found, you know, the predicted date of his death, basically, from actuarial tables. Yeah, right. And he put a countdown timer on his desktop. And so I've got one in my dashboard that I managed to find just uh, in the Mac App Store, a countdown timer, and, and found it. And, you know, it tells me how many days, minutes, or years, days, minutes, seconds left to live. And uh, it's just one of those reminders that I think sometimes it can come across as morbid, but other times I think it's actually, it's good to know that it's running out because it does focus you on what is important right now and what do I actually want to achieve? Now, Toby, this is great stuff. And uh, I've been doing a lot of interviews for the book on this book tour. This is the first time I've ever talked about this. This is really cool. So you're right. Like I, you can go online and find these like, you know, death calculators, your countdown <laughs> calculators, right? And yeah. it sounds morbid. And a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, I'd never do that. <laughs> the, I love this concept of having this visual reminder of, you know, the time is fleeting. And in fact, we, of course, just because your calculator says one thing, none of that's guaranteed, right? No, no, we all know, no, know people that, no, that no, never stretch. get their time, right? Mm. And, and here's a couple other things. I know, I met a guy once, I can't remember his name, who's at a conference. He, <laughs> this is talking about morbid, he bought his own funeral urn. So he has, <laughs> he has his own funeral urn with his name and the, the birth date on it. It's not engraved his death date, but it's sitting on his freaking desk as a reminder oh, that wow. someday his ashes are going to be in there. And yeah. then an, another one, a little less creepy is, um, I know people who will figure out how many weekends they have left in their life, right? So how many, you know, whatever your, your number of years are left, divide that by the 52 weeks, that's your weekends. And they put marbles in a jar. So, you know, if I've got whatever it is, you know, 600 weekends left or, or, or 1,300 weekends, whatever that number is, they put them in a jar somewhere where they're going to see them, you know, all, all day. And then every Saturday, they take a marble out of the jar. And it's just a reminder of like, Look, you know, you don't have that many weekends left. And and some people, you know, will will use it as a way to say, all right, am I gonna work all weekend or am I gonna go connect with my family and go go play or whatever? But all of these, whether it's the the dashboard time or, or that urn or or the marbles, I think really getting a sense of your own mortality will help you to live a richer life. I mean, I really do think that's true. Yeah, I'm I'm a big believer. I'm a big believer in that. I mean another Final story from my tool set, I guess, is is just that every time I jump on a plane, I think, you know, if, if I die, am I, if this plane goes down, because of course, you know, it feels like a Coke can flying up in the air right. at times. But if this plane goes down, do the people I love know I love them? And am I happy with what I'm doing each day and, and what I've accomplished so far? And provided I can sort of say yes to those questions, then I know I'm at least somewhere in the ballpark of where I want to be. 
And, you know, that's just another point, I guess, that I use in terms of using death as a reminder as well, because it is, it's so sudden and, um, yeah, it can come on us at any time. Those are great questions, great check-ins to make sure, you know, you're living the life uh, that, you, that you want to lead. And why, you know, I tend to do a lot of, you know, keynote talks or, or whatever based on the books. So I'm on an airplane almost every week. And <laughs> now, Toby, I've never, I've never told another human being what I'm about ready to tell you. <laughs> um, I've never told this to me. So I fly a lot. And, you know, we've all been on those planes where, I mean, sometimes there's a little bit of turbulence, but most of us, if you've flown a lot, you sometimes some of those flights get pretty rough. And maybe mm. like two, three times a year, there will be all of a sudden some turbulence where it's really going up and down on the sides. And like you hear people getting really upset and the seasoned travelers are white knuckling it. Well, <laughs> when, whenever I, so two, three times a year, when all of a sudden I'm on a flight that's getting really dicey. <laughs> now, logically, I kind of know like it takes a lot to bring a plane down. It's not impossible, but like it doesn't freak me out that much. But I try to scare myself and I go with the moment and I'm thinking like, okay, this plane is going down. Uh, this is it. This is absolutely it. What do I regret that I haven't done? What do I regret that I haven't finished yet? You know, what will be undone when this plane goes down with me on it. And then of course the plane lands and it's fine. But yeah. I really use that as a check-in time to say, all right, am I similar to what you're doing? Am I happy with where I am today? Or should I really be, you know, connecting with someone or working in an area that I just haven't been working on lately? Mm. Oh, that's fascinating. Because I, I often think that, you know, the the stick, as much as the carrot and the goal is an enticing area, it's so important to have a bit of stick behind it as well. Absolutely. The psychology of actually getting to where you want to go, I think. So, um, yeah. Oh, it's really interesting that you uh, use those same <laughs> moments as well, Kevin. That's great. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only odd bot out here in the world. <laughs> but, Kevin, let's jump into a few others. I mean, what was the most surprising tip that you found in your research? Yeah, I, I, the thing that jumped out at me, which, you know, gets some hate mail, is basically, I mean, ultra productive people, by and large, they don't use to-do lists. They don't use to-do lists. And the problem with to-do lists are, well, first of all, there was a study done last year that showed that 41%, for one, 41% of items on the to-do list are never done at all. And half the items that are done are done within about an hour of us writing them on the list. So, you know, they're, they're not very effective. And it's because there's no time boundaries. So we tend to do the things uh, that are fast. You know, they're not, most people don't prioritize them right. So instead of working on what's, you know, important, we tend to work on what's urgent. There's something called the Zeigernick effect, which says when our unconscious knows that there's stuff that we need to do, but there's no plan to do it, that raises all of our stress hormones. And that's why we start to feel so overwhelmed. So the lists make us feel worse. They don't help us to get the right things done. And most of the stuff doesn't get done anyway. Uh, and it's because to-do lists were invented from Ivy Lee over 100 years ago. And they can work when you don't have a lot to do, when things you know, are at a slower pace. <laughs> when you pace. don't need a list? Yeah, when you don't need a list. When you, if you want to be an average performer, to-do lists, knock yourself out. They're fine. But for ultra productive people, they don't use a to-do list, they use a calendar. And it sounds like a simple twist, but it's a powerful one. Basically, they are taking everything they need to do and putting it onto their calendar. They're switching that default 30 or 60 minute time slot on Google Calendar or Outlook Calendar, they're adjusting it down to 15 minutes. And they're booking not just meetings and appointments and podcast interviews, they're making appointments with themselves. The entrepreneur Chris Ducker was really passionate about this. He says, you know, 15 minutes of social media time, scheduled on my calendar. 45 minutes at the end of the day to process my email, scheduled on my calendar. Phone calls, scheduled on my calendar. Quiet time to think and to be strategic or to be creative, scheduled on the calendar. And over and over again, you know, that's what I heard. These ultra productive people, all those message notifications from Facebook and Snapchat and text messages and email, they're all shut off. There's no buzz, there's no ding, the window's not open in the browser, it's shut down. They're scheduling time even to process, not, not check, they don't check their email, they process their email as an important task like any other task. Reed Hoffman from LinkedIn, he has on most days one to two hours of 
quote unquote, you know, buffer time in his afternoon with absolutely nothing scheduled except alone time. So he can be strategic and think and, you know, regroup on the business. So it sounds like a little thing like, oh, well, that's just, you know, moving things onto the calendar. That's not a big deal. Once you're forced to pick a day, a time to think about, oh, is this a 15 minute task or a one hour task? That is a big difference. And all of a sudden, that Zygernik effect goes away. Even though you haven't done the task yet, your brain, just by scheduling it, it, it reduces all those, those stress hormones. It doesn't, can't tell the difference. So stress goes down and the odds of you actually doing the item go way, way up. And, and related to this is it was, uh, let's see, behavioral psychologist Dan Ariely talks about our brains are strongest in the morning, about an hour after we've woken up. And for about a two or three hour window in the morning, you know, that's when our bodies and minds are refreshed from our sleep and glucose is in our, the front part of our brain. So glucose is what we need to burn for focus, attention, all this stuff. And that's when we're most productive. But most people, what do we do? Oh, let's ease into our day. We'll drink some coffee. Let's check email. Maybe let's check Facebook. Oh, I'll get the easy stuff done on my to-do list. I'll sign some expense reports or whatever it is. Well, Dan says like, You need that two hour window is when you need to do your most important work. And so, you know, I call it, most people call it your most important task, your MIT. Ultra productive people know like, yeah, I got to do a hundred things today, but I also know what my number one thing, my one thing. And Toby, it's almost like a mantra for me. So I have a time block every day from at least eight to 10. Sometimes it's a little bit longer every morning and every morning it's just, MIT time, most important task. And then usually at least the night before, often a few days earlier, I know what my most important thing is going to be for that day. I mean, if I'm in book writing mode, it might be to put my butt in a chair and get 2000 words on a page. My MIT, how I'm going to win the day is by writing 2000 words. Then whatever else happens or doesn't happen happens, but I'm going to feel good about this day if I get 2000 more words written. Or if I'm book promotion mode, it's going to be I need to launch that landing page for my new book. So that my MIT is to spend two hours on designing a landing page, right? So Mm -hmm. it can change, it should change, but just knowing, okay, how am I gonna win the day? How am I gonna win the day before lunch? And work on your most important task as early in the morning as possible without interruptions. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, one of the actual counterintuitive pieces that I found in your book too, Kevin, was um, the original, was it the original CEO of Intel? Uh, Yes. Like just that idea that your to-do list is never done or, you know, there is always more work. And therefore, somehow that when I read that in the book, it, it really sort of helped me to understand in a way that is so blindingly obvious, but just that if you can never, ever get everything done, then, you know, you don't have to worry about getting everything done. Yeah, that, that's right. I, that book, that, that changed, I, I remember my life changed in a moment. So that's um, Andy Grove, who used Andy to be Grove, the that's it, yeah. Yeah, founder and chairman of Intel. Most people know him from like his popular book was Only the Paranoid Survive. But this mm-hmm. one is called High Output Management. Yeah. And you're right. So he talked about how, now, you know, it, it, you got to imagine like you're, you're freaking running Intel, right? So you're making cool. decisions about billion dollar chip factories. You've got um, back in the day, you know, the Japanese uh, chip manufacturers dumping chips on the market. You got regulation. You're negotiating with Microsoft and Apple. You got a million, billion things going on and lots of jobs and money at stake. And he basically said, you know, every day uh, he left work at, I think it was 6.30, 6 o'clock, you know, at, at a reasonable hour, he went home. And he says, it didn't matter what he got done in the day because there would always be more to do. You know, he says, there's always more that can be done, you know, always more that we can do. So you said it right there, Toby, if all of a sudden our mind shift changes and it's not like I'm going to leave when I'm caught up or when I'm done, because that doesn't work. I mean, when I was young and dumb and, 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 and married at the time, I would be five o'clock and I'd be like, okay, it's really the end of the day. I'm swamped. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to push. I'll, I'll stay till six. Then at six. And it's like uh, before, you know, even text messages, it'd be like calling the wife. Hey, uh, something's come up in the office. I'm going to be home late for dinner. Next, when are you going to be home? Uh, I'll leave at 630. Then I look down. It's seven o'clock. I'm still in the freaking office, right? Mm-hmm. We all have these moments where we just get caught up and it's later and later and later. And once you you make that shift and realize, 
there will always be more things that can be done, then you, you look back and say, all right, what do I value in my life and how do I want to allocate my 1440? So, you know, look, it, it, and no judgment. I mean, but if you say you value your health and you aren't spending any minutes each week exercising, well, you really don't value your health. It's all lip service, right? Mm. So if you say, look, I value my business. I, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm, I want to I want to be successful. Well, knock yourself out. Maybe you do allocate 40 hours, 50 hours, 60 hours, 70 hours, whatever those hours are. But if you also then say, I value my spouse, I value my kids, I value my health, I value charity, I value my faith. Well, then all of a sudden you need to be thinking about, listen, there's only 1440. So how am I going to allocate to each? I'm willing to work 55 hours a week in my business, but that's going to have to be enough. If I can't figure it out in 55 hours, I'm doing something wrong because I want five hours of charity time. And I want one hour a night with my kids. And I want, you know, one full day a week of, you know, only family time, whatever your values are, are your values, but it's to be intentional about what they are. And then to live your life the way you want, you know, you should be able to look at your calendar and those time blocks reflect who you want to be. You know, every Thursday night from six to 10 is blocked off as date night with the spouse. Mm. And that's just, that's just ironclad. And I'm going to leave that freaking office, even if the building's burning down, because my other value, in addition to work, is date night. You know, my every Saturday morning is blocked out for the soccer game because I love going to Owen soccer games. And I don't care if, you know, my book is going to now be two days late to the editor because I also value time with my son, you know, so it's a whole different mind shift once you realize there's always going to be more things to do at work. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. Yeah, it's amazing. And Kevin, what's what's been sort of your, or has there been one of these tips that you weren't aware of that you have subsequently sort of put into action for yourself in the process of writing and research that you really gravitated to? Yeah, you know, I think, Toby, I think most of these things I was doing uh, at some points, but I wasn't as disciplined and consistent. You know, so, so, if we do something over and over again, it's a habit. And when we attach habits, stack habits on top of each other, they become rituals. And so, you know, where I've gotten a lot better, for example, uh, is my morning routine. And this was another big surprise because, I mean, as you know, I mean, you know, what I asked you, it wasn't, it wasn't a, I wasn't trying to lead you in a certain direction. I said, hey, Toby, you know, as, as an Olympian, give me your best piece of, of time management advice, productivity advice. You could have said anything you wanted. And a lot of people, I'm, I'm expecting something about to-do lists or calendars or whatever. A lot of people said, oh, time management productivity, it's my morning routine. It's what I do the first 30 to 60 minutes of my morning. And now I always had somewhat of a morning routine, but I didn't realize that this was like a consistent thing among, I mean, it came up from so, so many people. You know, mm. Tony Robbins talks about it, Arnold Schwarzenegger. You mentioned Tim Ferriss, Gary Vaynerchuk, John Lee Dumas. Um, Hal Elrod is famous for the morning, you know, the miracle morning routine. Yeah. And I can't say everybody's doing exactly the same thing, but most people, one, they're getting up at a pretty early hour. You know, a lot of people will get up at five or earlier, but usually it's around six ish or so. And then, you know, they're doing some kind of uh, physical movement. It's not necessarily their hard workout, but they're going for that 20 minute walk or that 20 minutes of yoga or, or something of that nature. They're doing something for their mind. And some people will meditate, others will pray, uh, some people will read uh, you know, inspirational texts, but they're doing something kind of spiritual um, and, and mental, uh, journaling, a lot of people will journal. And then the, you know, the third big piece though is the nutrition piece. So they're drinking water, you know, you're, you get dehydrated just from eight hours of not drinking overnight. They're drinking water and they're eating. You know, I, when I was young and dumb, I was hopping in my car with a cup of coffee, going to work. I was skipping breakfast thinking I'm saving time and I'm saving calories. Ultra productive people aren't skipping breakfast. They know that food is fuel. So if you want to get that glucose you know, into your brain, your prefrontal cortex, you're going to wake up and in that first 30 minutes to 60 minutes, you're going to do some kind of green, you know, protein shake. I like, um, 
the mantra 30 and 30, 30 grams of protein in 30 minutes, which is kind of a lot. But, you know, I, I do a protein shake that I throw a handful of blueberries, a handful of spinach in. Other people will start with a green shake and add, you know, protein of some kind. But when I realize what everyone else is doing, I've gotten much more consistent with getting up, you know, uh, like I don't I don't really need to get up at any time. Right. Unless it's my kids seeing them off to school, but making sure I'm getting up early with time to do that routine, even if I'm on, like I used to slack off if I was traveling, you know, and in a hotel, I'm in a hotel, what can I do about it? Well, you can still get up early in a hotel, do yoga stretches, you know, do meditation, that kind of, that kind of work. So I've gotten a lot better about that, packing my protein for the road, those kinds of things. Mm. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because I think the routine or the idea of the routine seems to very much be a consistent theme of top performers, but then everyone's routine is different. And it's almost as though just as long as you're doing something consistently first up. Exactly. It's it's almost irrelevant what that is, but whatever suits you has seemed to be what uh, has been what I've picked up. So it's interesting to hear you say that as well, Kevin. That's awesome. So Kevin, um, a bit more about you just to wrap us up if that's all right. But I'm always interested, who do you learn from and how do you go about that learning process? Yeah, I, I am a voracious learner and I've been accused on more than one occasion of, in so, you know, take Kevin Cruz to a party and he just ends up like interviewing everyone like he's a journalist because, <laughs> you know, man, you know, it, I'd be like picking your brain about a million different things, you know, and um, uh, I guess it makes me a good listener, but I don't know about a party guest, but um, <laughs> I, so I am voracious about it. You know, I, um, uh, I, I, someone set me up with a lunch with last week I was in San Diego and had lunch uh, with Ken Blanchard and he's like a big leadership wow. guru, wrote the one minute manager and all yeah. this stuff. Yep. And he's, he's, you know, getting, uh, uh, you know, a little bit up there in, uh, in age, as he likes to say, he's not going to retire. He's going to refire. And, um, <laughs> you know, I thought it was going to be a 30 minute, you know, lunch and I would get what I could out of him. We talked for, for three hours and I literally had a notebook out and I'm like, I'd ask him a question like a reporter and then I'd write down <laughs> everything he said, but oh, boy. You know, how can, how can you not? And How then, you, you know, not? Yeah. like you, I know you are a, a voracious reader. Uh, yeah. We have a mutual friend in, in Vern Harnish. And, you know, I read um, at least a book a week, usually several. Um, I love to listen to podcasts when I'm on the treadmill. Uh, so, I mean, technology is great for that. I mean, I still love books and my Kindle and all those things. But I mean, for people who say, oh, I'm not a reader. Well, that's great. We'll do a 20 minute walk in the morning and, you know, listen to Toby Jenkins, listen to John Lee Dumas. I mean, there's just you you now have access to the wisdom of top performers. I mean, in whatever field you're in, it isn't just the marketers, right? I mean, whatever no. field you're in, the elite are freely sharing their information. You want to go make $100,000 as an indie author? There's at least six podcasts for free that tell you every week what to do to go do that. I mean, it's crazy what is available to everyone today. It is amazing, isn't it? And I think that's often part of the challenge, right, is just the sheer overwhelm of the availability of the information, but hence why, you know, is there any particular source that you find yourself really gravitating or how do you filter through, you know, all the options that are available? Yeah, and you bring up a good point because learning (laughs) overdone can be a form of procrastination, right? So instead of, you know, ready, aim, fire, it's ready, 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 ready. (laughs) And so a lot of wannabe entrepreneurs and and people that want to launch, they'll never feel ready and they're, I got to learn more, I got to learn more, I'm not ready. And so that is something recently I've tried to become more, you know, the more content you consume, the less you're going to produce. So you want to be a content producer in this day. I mean, you know this more than I do. You're the marketer here, right? So, you know, to be a content marketer, you need to produce content, not just consume content. And so, you know, for myself, like I subscribe to dozens of email newsletters like most people, but there's only a couple that hit my primary inbox. And, I, you know. Well, Vern Harnish, yep. uh, so people who don't right. know him, H-A-R-N-I-S-H, Vern Harnish Gazelles, he is, you know, the best consultant there is when it comes to, you know, growing a, a fast growing business. You know, I had a chance. Yeah, I mean, he saved one of my businesses and, and he's one of the few people, you know, I credit with getting us getting me into a multimillion dollar, you know, Mark Vern Harnish. Like I mentioned, for my business growth stuff, Vern is, is the man. For my author stuff, again, there's a dozen great forums and groups that are out there, but 
I subscribe to Steve Scott's newsletter and more importantly, the um, Pat's first Kindle book group on Facebook. And, you know, uh, sometimes I guess on a Sunday, lazy Sunday morning, I'll scan the other ones. But usually it's like that 80 20 rule. If I'm just in that one group, you know, reading once a day for 10 minutes, I'm up to speed. I know what's going on. I'm trying to think of some other uh, ones that jump out. No, they're great uh, examples. Yeah, I mean, those are the big ones. Yeah, yeah, that's that's, that's awesome. Because, uh, yeah, that filtering process is often, you know, there's just, because I'm exactly the same. I, Vern's makes it through. Tim Ferriss's stuff I nearly always read. And, you know, then I've got, I'm subscribed to tons, tons of email newsletters. But they're probably the two that I, you know, almost never not read, you know. So, How about um, uh, who's your favorite podcasters? I really enjoyed <laughs> Tim's podcast as well, Ferris's yeah. podcast, and actually a guy called Sean D'Souza too. He, his is a great um, podcast. He's based in New Zealand, and we've sort of connected with him over the years. But he's uh, yeah, really interesting podcast too. I'm not familiar with D'Souza. I'll check that one out. Yeah, it's it's good. The three month vacation podcast. That one is called. Oh, that's great. And okay, a bit of rapid fire for you then, Kevin. Has there been a book that's changed your life or changed your worldview? Well, you know, I, I mentioned High Output Management, which is, is a good one for the, the productivity angle. And then uh, just for life, um, uh, now I'm forgetting it, Viktor Frankl's uh, uh, Man's Man Search, Search for, for Meaning. Meaning. Yeah, yeah Man's Search for right Meaning up. is a life changer as well. Yeah, yeah. Couldn't agree more. I'd need to get onto Andy Groves' book, though, by the sounds of things. Um, yeah. do, you, do you have a favorite quote or piece of advice that you use for inspiration? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I like to, to say again, you know, life is about making an impact, not an income. And, you know, the, the beauty in that is it's just as simple as, you know, the more value you put out there, the more you're going to get in return anyway. And it's just the right way to live. But for those, you know, but it will also enrich your life, including, you know, the monetarily. So it's really about making an impact, not an income. Mm, it's a great way to look at it too. Is there something that has become more important to you over time? Sleep. <laughs> <laughs> now, Toby, I got to say, That's... of all the, the Olympic athletes, I interview, you didn't really mention too much in your interview, but the group that talked about sleeping a lot was the Olympic athletes. They're all yeah. talking about taking naps, sleep. Hey, you better rest or you're going to catch a cold. You know, for a bunch of so hardcore true. athletes, you know, it, it looks like you're all lazing around. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it is actually something that I have really taken across to business is the importance of recovery. And I guess, you know, productivity, as you mentioned earlier, you know, you burn the midnight oil and plenty of people see that as a badge of honor. But right. your ability to perform the next day is absolutely shot to bits. And that was a, your ability to recover in a training, you know, in a training environment and a game environment is absolutely one of the key lessons from my water polo career, without a doubt. Because, I mean, on so many levels, but ultimately it's about learning and, and processing what you've learned and trained in that day and if you can't sleep to whether it's sleep and food and nutrition water and all, all that sort of stuff if you can't recover and mentally as well you know and relax then your body can't process it and you don't improve and you don't get the gains that you've just busted busted your hours and you know your body over to try to improve so it's a huge un highly underrated piece of the puzzle recovery for sure that's that's great Mm. And a final personal question from me, Kevin, I have a uh, one-year-old little girl. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering <laughs> if you were to give yourself advice back when your daughters were one, what, what would that advice look like knowing what you know now? What would, what would your advice be to yourself? You know, with uh, with three kids, uh, I've often told people, you know, kids are the best thing. Your children are the best thing in your life, but they're also going to be the hardest thing in your life. And one <laughs> is, is a hard age, right? And so I, I always, I was just having this conversation with another entrepreneur. I said, listen, you know, it's it's some of the best times and some of the best memories, but also the hardest, and it gets better, meaning your kids start, <laughs> eventually your kids will all start to sleep. You know, eventually they'll get out of diapers. Eventually they'll get out of the strollers and you know it's a cliche about you know the time flies but as I've seen I used to think like well you only have your kids till they're 18 and then they're off to, to school and you don't see them that much you really only have your kids until they're old enough to drive then you really stop seeing them <laughs> so 
So, you know, for my kids, you know, they, uh, I love them and they love me, but they still want the car keys to go out with their friends on the weekends to go do things. And I think that, you know, the first, uh, I don't know, probably seven years with your kids are so key. I think you could probably really screw up as a dad when they're 10 and 15 and 20, and it really doesn't matter that much. It's like how you are as a dad from age zero to seven is going to set your relationship for the whole rest of your lives. So as hard as it is to be patient, you know, to do all that you need to do, to find the time to be there and all that, it does get better. You do start to get some of your time back. You know, they won't be so trying as you get more and more sleep and all that, but like really invest in it because whatever you put into those early childhood years, you're going to get, you know, the next 60 years of joy, 70 years of joy, you know, after, after that. That's awesome advice. Thank you, mate. I really appreciate that. (laughs) Um, And then finally, how can people connect with you, Kevin? Thank you. You It's been awesome just talking through all this stuff with you. I I love the topic and really appreciate you coming on the show. So how can people find out more about you? No, thanks, Toby. I'm passionate about the topic. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, The best thing, I mean, if if people can buy the the book and shipping uh, just by going on on uh, Amazon.com or just go, if you're willing to pay the shipping, I'll send the paperback to you. It's 15timesecrets.com, 15timesecrets.com. And uh, my name's, you know, kevincruz.com if you want to get in touch with me personally. Fantastic. Well, as I say, Kevin, thanks so much. It's been great to share this hour with you and uh, it's been fantastic to thanks again for being included in your book as well. And yeah, I think it's a such an important topic regardless of the discipline that you focused on. And yeah, I really appreciate your research and sharing everything you've learned. Thanks, Toby. Thanks, Kevin. This show is brought to you by our 33 free marketing templates. You can download them at bluewiremedia.com dot com dot au slash book now we would love your feedback we would love your questions and also any guest suggestions you can contact me on email i am toby.jenkins at bluewiremedia.com.au or on twitter i am at toby underscore jenkins also if you enjoyed the show we would love it if you could leave us a review on itunes thanks so much and see you next time (laughs) 